Thank you. Uh, we're going to get started again because we have our lunch delivered and uh, try not to keep it cooling in the back there. Uh, James, are you ready to go? But you're... Of course, always. Oh, right, always. Okay, take it away. Okay, so this is the final question uh, of, of the forum. What we're going to do is after we finish this question and we'll spend about half an hour, uh, half an hour on it, uh, if anyone else has any other little questions or statements uh, they want to make that we feel haven't uh, really addressed uh, in enough detail, we can allow 10 minutes maybe for that. Um, so this is, this is question six, which I suppose is the, is the broadest of them all but also one of the most um, inescapable, because um, Jeffrey uh, is an artist, but he's also a man of ideas, a man of many ideas in many different fields, and, um, and we've, we've all heard a lot about those ideas over the years. Sorry about the microphone. Um, so, this, I mean, this, this raises one of the... Probably better when it's off anyway. Um, so this raises one of these perennial questions that um, that art historians and, and academics have to have to answer on on this is that is that what what is the relationship between the artist and their work? What is the relationship between their ideas and their work? Do you have to understand their idea? I mean, the, the old conundrum obviously is the Wagner and you know Wagner's political beliefs versus Wagner as a as an artist. So. Um, not, I'm not comparing Jeffrey to Wagner, obviously, but the question... <laughs> but Jeffrey does have lots of ideas, and I, it'd be nice to use this session to try and um, tease out some of those connections and whether we can make connections between what he does with his hands and what he does in the park as an artist and what he, uh, what he thinks. Um, so, Jeffrey, I mean, I know that um, Peter might have some things to say about this, but is there anything you want to say to kick us off? Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, on the tours, there's really only one thing that I try to concentrate on uh, at the beginning of the tours, and that's the relationship between uh, oral and visual counterpoint. And that seems to be a very, very difficult uh, uh, idea to, to write about, as you know. And we've been looking for someone who, who might be able to write about it. But I would say that it's the key that I use on the tours to introduce people to sculpture so that it becomes uh, less of an obscure or foreign object to take a look at. And so that's the only idea that I feel is the one that is absolutely necessary in order to uh, begin to understand not only my sculpture, but uh, in my opinion, sculpture itself. So. This is this is something I always found fascinating about you is that you're 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 someone who's read widely. You've read a lot of philosophy. You love to talk about the German idealists. Um, you've got ideas about the age of agriculture and transgenic engineering, and, and you're extremely well informed about 20th century politics. And yet, on the sculpture tours, you really only uh, discuss the works formally. You just you know you talk about how they've been cited, how the how the the different forms change over the over the series, and I've always found that fascinating. Um, but Peter, I think, has has done quite a lot of thinking um, on this issue, and uh, I know he wants to say a few things. Yeah. I shall be referring uh, like an old-fashioned preacher to a text in a minute. That's why you've all got copies of this book. But I won't tell you immediately where the text is, of course, because then you'll get ahead of the script. <laughs> Um, do we need to know about Rubinoff's ideas to appreciate his work? Uh, two answers, simply. Um, first one following on from what both of you have just said. If we, w if we simply want to appreciate the work or the works of sculpture that Jeffrey has produced, we don't need an apparatus of formal interpretation. We don't, in, in that sense, need ideas in order to make sense of this. The works should speak for themselves. Je Jeffrey's very insistent, I think, on this point. They are the message. The message isn't something that we then translate into words in order to make sense of the 
works of art as such. So um, in that sense, we don't need ideas like that. There's another uh, level on which you could talk about ideas, which would be the the ideas, the, 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 the sort of thinking uh, that, that's gone into the creation of particular works. Now, that's something that is important, but I'm not competent to deal with it. So that's not what I'm talking about either. You know, that would be like, you might ask Jeffrey, what gave you the idea for doing this, this work? Well, I'd, I'd, that, that's, that, that's not my pitch at all. Jeffrey has ideas, though, in another sense than this, which is, in fact, the reason why we're all meeting today and why um, uh, the, the forum was started and, and, and why this is an ongoing uh, enterprise, which is to discuss his ideas in a, in a more uh, formal sense about the world, about the, uh, the role of art within it. That's where we come to the text. Turn, if you will, to page 134 <laughs> in the book. Now, this, uh, <laughs> this is the beginning of Jeffrey's um, presentation to the uh, 2012 forum, Existential Realities of Post-Agriculture. Some of us were there at the time, others of you uh, missed this great experience. Um, and it begins with six aphorisms there. I was born in the shadow of the end game, to which we've already referred, I am an artist, self-evidently true. Art is an act of will in accordance with a mature conscience. Again, Jeffrey's already referred to that in relation to Simone de Beauvoir and uh, the, um, the sense which he had uh, from the statements that, that, that she made about the importance of the artist responding in this way. There can be no resignation, he says, the artist is witness to existence itself. The artist is witness to existence itself, I think, is, is, refers to the sense of the art speaking in, in an unmediated way or unmediated, unmediated by words um, uh, in, in giving an expression. Art is the celebration, and that's the coda to these to this set of aphorisms. And as Jeffrey admits here, uh, he, 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 was, um, he, he was guilty of uh, self-plagiarism. So ended my 2011 presentation, he <laughs> said. And it begins the 2012 uh, presentation. Uh, is this because uh, Jeffrey was so idle he thought they'll never notice, I'll just <laughs> drop the same stuff out all over again? Or uh, isn't it rather more likely that he'd given a great deal of thought to the formulation of those aphorisms, each of them packed with meaning and, and, and insight, uh, which uh, we ought to um, unpack in, in some way. And um, what I'd like to uh, just concentrate on here, and I'm only just, just going to spend a couple of minutes uh, ju just um, uh, feeding this in, not, not to ex expound it in any more formal way, is his concentration on the role of the artist himself, if you like. What is the, what is the, um, what is the artist uh, doing and how does this relate to his concept of society and why should this appear in um, um, a an exposition of his own thinking that was called existential realities of post-agriculture. Where does agriculture come into this? Which is, initially I must say, when James and Maria and myself all joined this forum at the, at the same moment in, in 2011, I think we were, we were all slightly baffled in the first place by the emphasis on the age of agriculture and the significance that it had. Uh, and it's taken us certainly taken me some time to, uh, to unpack uh, these meanings. And you can all read about it for yourselves in, in Jeffrey's own words here, but let, let me just give my interpretation of, of what, what, what is uh, essential for, for Jeffrey here, which is that historically, and by hist Historically, we mean not just terms in, uh, in terms of recorded history, but prehistory as well, which can only be reconstituted through the archaeological evidence. In terms of um, 
history, the, the beginning of an age of agriculture where agriculture became the way in which society was organ organized and produced its, its, uh, um, its resources is of fundamental uh, significance because with the advent of agriculture, the whole thing becomes territorial. And because it becomes territorial in protecting your own crops, you protect your own land. In short, you need warriors to do this. You have the beginnings of a militaristic organization of society, perhaps the only sort of society that we're generally familiar with. And what Jeffrey is saying is that the age of agriculture in this very long-term sense is of fundamental importance in that way because it legitimates the, the role of the, of the uh, military as such. Now, he's arguing, of course, against a conventional belief, well, mankind has always been warlike. We've always had wars, haven't we? Maybe on smaller scale in the past. No, says Jeffrey. And that's where the significance of the cave paintings, especially those at, at, at Chauvet, which um, date back 35,000 years, become so centrally significant to, to Jeffrey's understanding of history and, 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 the, and the world, because Jeffrey says, you look at those cave paintings, you have wonderful artistic images. You had artists, and what do they show? Or, or, or what don't they show? What they don't show is war. Got it? The artist predates the warrior. Here we have a society which on the available evidence, as Jeffrey argues, was not based on war. As Hobbes would have it, the war of every man against every man in which uh, life is, is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Oh no, we have, we have, back in those days, before the advent of agriculture, provided the, 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 the logic and necessity for continual warfare, we have a different sort of society which privileged the place of the artist. And you could say, to caricature slightly, um, Jeffrey is, wants to you know, re reconstitute that, 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 go that golden age, but, or let me put it um, a more um, um, uh, in, 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 in a more straightforward way that, uh, that this suggests that the artist retains a privileged role within society as the voice of conscience, the activity of being an artist is in that sense, in itself, um, a protest against this militaristic model of society. And this, I suggest, is why Jeffrey feels so strongly uh, about this in relation, of course, to what we were talking about earlier this morning about the uh, realities of modern warfare on its gross industrial scale and leading us in, into the nuclear age, that in this context too, the role of the artist is not directly to engage in politics as such, as some side issue, some side activity. The role of the artist is to do his or her, her own work in accordance with what Jeffrey calls a mature conscience, and that in itself is what the artist can contribute here. Now, uh, that is a, uh, a thumbnail sketch of some of the thinking of Jeffrey Rubinoff. Obviously, it's grossly incomplete. I hope it doesn't do violence to any of uh, Jeffrey's central insights. It's what I would pick on, what I take from Jeffrey's work as, as being uh, what, what really ties together uh, his, his life as an artist, but one who is situated within a world in which he feels social responsibilities, which he sums up in terms of the appeal to conscience here. Jeffrey, do you have a response to that? That's wonderful, Peter. Yes, uh, I can't say anything better than it's wonderful, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> 
Yes, that's that's an excellent description. Thank you. It's short anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Karun wants to speak. Um, I, I agree. I think that that is a great uh, summary. I mean, I've been um, I haven't had as much problem with the, these concepts as I don't think I I view them a little more naively because I'm, I'm just not in the same position as many of you are of having to grapple with these issues and define them and pick them apart quite rigorously. So for me, it was quite an intuitive, it was an easy intuitive leap. One of the things that I found quite startling, though, uh, was um, the confirmation that there really indeed was a change in the, in, in the art of the, from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic. We saw that last year. I just wanted to, you know, you don't have a copy of this, the latest uh, report, but um, I'll just read to you what, um, Arthur Farrell, who is an expert in uh, ancient warfare and did a, uh, a paper stretching that back to the Neolithic times uh, when uh, at the beginning of the age of agriculture, he didn't quite make a, he didn't quite confirm whether war or agriculture came first, but they did come together in his opinion. What he said of Paleolithic art, the art of the Paleolithic period is just very different from that of the Neolithic. I looked at a lot of Paleolithic art hoping to find some evidence of warfare, but I didn't find anything. And so this is, this is an expert in this field looking at a lot more art than we were presented in, uh, in 2010 uh, by Jeffrey, uh, who also you know, noted that, uh, and I think that was a really interesting confirmation for me as well. So you know, in following from your uh, statement, I do believe that you can come to the park and, and I think it's quite interesting to, to be introduced to sculpture and the way that Jeffrey uh, has this compositional technique uh, you know, as a way of just simply looking at it, learning how to look at it. Uh, but I, I personally think you get a lot more out of it by understanding how the artist's thinking evolved and what the work has done to inform that thinking. And indeed, um, it just it enriches the experience. So it doesn't it doesn't uh, it's not necessary for for any kind of uh, you know enjoyment or or uh, gaining of any kind of knowledge from it. But it certainly enriches it. And I think it would be sad to completely divorce it, as, as uh, we've had these debates in the past. And I think that. People have moved from one side of the one side of this debate to the to the other. Um, anyway, that's what I wanted to contribute. Does anyone else? Mark uh, Breeze wants to say something. I had a quick. Um, I'm interested in, in in your in the ownership of your work, which is obviously important. But you very explicitly sign all your works in a very readable way. Uh, you've called the park the Jeffrey Rubinoff Sculpture Park, not the 2750 Shingle Spit Road Sculpture Park. Um, so, so there's an implicit you know, ownership, but also a statement of uh, it's about you as a person and, and your history. And I wonder whether there's, is it important to understand more of your personal history as well as your ideas? Or, or is there a... Hmm. Uh, I've included that in... A, in uh, the previous paper, in the shadow of the end game. So uh, it is there, and it is in writing. It's not in that book, but it, we, it's, it's, it's on the shelf, and it's online as well. Yeah, so it's far more personal. It's far more personal, yeah. And you'd think that's important for people, ideally, to? Well, I was, was never sure, but it, it brought I, I work a strange way. I start always at the beginning. The, the beauty of, of, to me, of the way I ended up working was is that when you're done a piece, you're back to zero. You, the canvas is cleared and you're beginning all over again. And so what I do on each piece is, is I, I go back to the very beginning again and then bring myself up to where I am. And so I've done the same sort of with my with these forums is, is to go back to the beginning. Just as starting with Paleolithic art and then moving to post-agriculture is a possibility with me. So you can't get to post-agriculture if you don't deal with Paleolithic art. If you start with Neolithic art, you say, hey, the warfare was already built in. So it's this back to the beginning again. And so each paper to me is starting over again. 
And what I purposefully did, untailing from one to the other, is adding continuity the way that I do it in the work, is that there's continuity between the last paper and the new paper, and that's why I, as self-plagiarism, as, as Peter put it, <laughs> so kindly. <laughs> Okay. So the next paper I do, if I do another paper, and it's very likely I will, will use the tailings of the last paper to do it the same way. And so that is the thing that gives my work continuity, and that's the way that I, I like my writing to be as well. Is, is that? I think David uh, was wanting to say something. Do you want the microphone? I want to ask a, just... just um, questions from, uh, in fact, from what you've um, said. Um, I, how do you know, so two parts, how do you know when um, a, your work on uh, a sculpture, on, on one of your pieces, is complete? First question. Second question, you said, again, that you, you then, when you start again. Now, um, I mean, in my, my own instincts would have been that um, I work never sort of completely said, look, I've done as much on that as I can. If I want to take my ideas forward, I want to start again and use a slightly different vehicle. Uh, so it's not, but, it, but it's, in, it's in a path. It's not, it's not a clean sheet. It's not a start again. So this, this, does, does that make sense? Are, are yes, it does. Yes, it does. And this is what makes art different than, say, craft. You know, craft, you will never reach a moment of perfection. It, by definition, it can always be improved. So in order to understand, the, at least the way that I perceive art, so I, I can only speak for myself on this one, but I'd like to think that other artists do perceive the same thing. And that perfection would be ridiculous. Perfection would be the end of any evolution of art. So because I use perfection in the word of completion, and, and that's what you were hinting at was completion. So, so, so what can the artist gain, and this is what makes the perception so different, okay? What does the artist do in terms of perfection? He has a moment of perfection. Now that moment of perfection, I know when it enters the piece, even in the most initial drawing, and when it enters the piece, when the piece is capable of being art in the drawing stage, and that means there's a lot of rejection, but when the, piece, when the art enters the piece, and that art, I mean, is, is the potential for the moment of perfection. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the moment of perfection is all that one gains, not the perfection itself, because that would be the end of, that would be the end of evolution. So it's very different. From uh, one of the perception was it, was it Churchill actually? Someone talked about writing a book. It wasn't Churchill. Um, you, you know, it, you you give birth to ideas. You go through all the pangs, and then you finally get so fed up. Mm -hmm. You throw it to the public through a publisher. Right. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, totally different, obviously. Yeah. Th this is the difference between craft and in art. Is is that the artist does once he he knows that the art. This is for me. Once more. Once the art enters the piece which it will do usually in the drawing stages and in the initial stages, it becomes the obligation of the artist to, f to complete it. And, and so one would think, well, you know, you've had your moment of perfection, why even bother doing it? Because that's where all the work is, right? But that moment of perfection is the obligation to actually make the complete statement. Now, when I look at work from other artists, and I believe other artists do it as well, is, uh, uh, a good example are, are Michelangelo's slave pieces, for example, but I also use an example of Michelangelo's drawings that parts of them are missing, you know, I mean, they're, they're just not there in time. And I don't know how many people will stand in front of a, a slave piece and say, uh, now a, a slave piece and say, oh, he never got to finish this. But I have a different perception of that. And I have a perception that there is a point where there is this moment of perfection which those slave pieces have, and that brings it to its state of being. And that other artists can see that, other artists can see through the other eyes of artists, and that's part of this concept of active will in accord with the mature conscience for artists, is that they know whether they, they know whether or not they completed it. Even if everybody thinks this is the greatest painting or sculpture in the world, 
and it's bullshit because they never finished it. And I've seen many, many works of art that way from many people. So part of the commodification is, is to sell the name and not this moment of perfection. The moment of perfection then finishes that piece. And, no, and when I say it completes the piece, is I can look at a work like a, a, a two-thirds drawing of Michelangelo and know that that's what he meant, that this is what he meant. This work is complete. This, this work is complete, nothing more. Now, how, why is it complete? Because the artist knows that nothing more can be added to this that will ever improve it. Okay, so that, that's what makes a great work of art to me, is when I look at it and nothing more can be added to it to improve it. You could throw more paint on the canvas, you could do more of this, you could do that, but none of that will actually improve that moment of perfection. Now, Barry wanted to say something, and then Francis wanted to speak. Well, actually, this is quite dangerous, because I'm going to put David on the spot, in fact, a little bit. <laughs> so we've heard some assertions about the role of the artist. And in these assertions, perhaps not in this context, but are often made in contrast to the scientist. So in light of what we've heard, what do you think the role of the scientist is? And do you philosophize about that role? Okay. <laughs> I'll get you later. Um, <laughs> d the role of the scientist, and do I philosophize? I, well, when I was a, a, a practicing scientist, I never philosophized about the role of the scientist. I just wanted to do. And, um, I, for example, I worked in, I used uh, quantum mechanics and relativity, quantum field theory, all that stuff. I never thought about the foundations of quantum mechanics, never mind going into philosophy. I didn't even think about the fundamentals. Uh, I, it was the ability to do, to calculate, to predict, was what uh, drove me. So I'm ill-equipped to answer your questions. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, the role of the scientist, um, I do think that science, even in this utilitarian age, has to have the culture to articulate it, uh, itself as part, has to have the, the confidence, sorry, I've given the game away, to articulate itself uh, as part of the culture uh, of the world that we uh, live in. So we have to have that, aspect, and, and we have to... Um, uh, allow for, and we have to support in the way that I, uh, that, well, do we have to support somehow the, 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 um, the creative um, drive of, um, of scientists deserves support in the same way that the creative drive of uh, artists deserves support. And it's very interesting, actually, that um, even in this um, fairly utilitarian age, actually, it's often the individual uh, giver in support of science who actually has more vision about what they're doing than the research councils who are looking for you to articulate the potential impact of what, of what you're going to be doing and when it's assessed you've got to say what the impact was. Um, uh, so, uh, sorry, this is, I'm rambling. Really? Okay, so, uh, well, where was I? <laughs> um, so I was in the, um, so the role of the, um, of the scientist, I think it's part of our culture, but yes, we have this, um, so we're required uh, now, uh, more or less, to indicate what is the value or the potential value uh, of, if we're wanting money for the future, what's the um, potential uh, value of what we're doing? If we're wanting money from what we've done, what was its potential value? Yeah? So that's a bit of our uh, culture um, nowadays, which individual philanthropic giving actually enables us to escape from. Funnily, um, the, but the, it's very interesting that um, in that uh, debate we are asked to say what is the positive value. We are, I think, never asked to say what are the potential dangers and pitfalls, which really underlines the, the concerns that you have mm -hmm. about, um, well, in, initially um, nu the, the nuclear bomb and now mm -hmm. about transgenic stuff. Mm, that's more, very more. interesting. Um, Francis, I can, think. Can we quote you on that? I mean, that's fantastic because that is really important. That was a very critical yeah. statement. Yeah. Uh, Francis, well, my question I think. Would be, that's sort of fascinating, and I think it comes right back to what we've been talking about. Could, could, could the Higgs boson. Have I got that right? Is it Higgs boson? <laughs> could that particle have been found by somebody who'd been living on Hornby Island for 30 years. I mean, you, it, it, to what degree was it important that he right. was part okay. of the culture that you right. describe? 
Okay, so I mean, this, this is a slightly different, um, this is a, a mini lecture, but uh, I'll be, it should be less than a minute, mm -hmm. cut me off. Uh, that, um, so firstly, um, Peter Higgs didn't, uh, as I were, discover the part. I, should, I, I got that wrong, and I hope in the, in the, in, when I said it earlier, I hope the proceedings actually refer to um, hy hypothesize the existence in his theory, okay? So, uh, it was my fault. Um, so, he didn't do it, um, he sort of did it in isolation, but funnily enough, he came from um, a background which was different from the mainstream of the area in which he made the prediction. In fact, it's fascinating. He wanted to go into this area of particle physics theory um, for his PhD. He was advised at King's College London not to do it by a chemist called Coulson because it was too difficult to make an impact in the field. Yeah? So you don't always believe the, um, believe the advice of your, uh, of your PhD supervisor. Um, the, uh, so that was the first, and he came into it from a different field, because, and he had picked up there ideas which were transferable into the area of physics that he became interested in. Um, and maybe just um, a final comment that, um, that just to show how um, brutal research can be in, in the recognition that is given to it, uh, because um, there were others thinking along the same lines, but Peter was uh, the first and uh, explicit enough um, that it was very clear. People who elaborated on, had been thinking and elaborated later, they got recognition, but Peter got the prize. Now, your question was, could it have been thought about in, I haven't answered it, um, in, in sitting in the Orkneys, um, if you had provided you had been um, connected to the, uh, to a, provided you had training, you could, would, I, I think the, the, light, the idea that you could come up with these things in isolation from everything, I think that's quite, um, th that would be very unusual and dangerous, but he came in from a different angle with a different background. No, no, I wasn't suggesting in total isolation, but, mm -hmm. but not in, as part of the culture. So it's, it's going back to what we were talking yeah. about, sort of lines of transmission. Yeah. That you could have these intuitions or, yeah. or well, what he, we might call in this well, case, you know, really prophetic okay. sort of prediction. Okay, Here, here's a tiny thing which might, so uh, how did I know this word? Um, in a sense, uh, Peter was the equivalent of outsider art. That's, a little that's bit, a little bit, but boy, he, he was outside, well, no, no, it's not strictly true, outside or out, people, maybe people who haven't had formal training, and that is not true, so that's a, that's a wrong statement, erase it from the record, okay? Yeah. Uh, the, um, but he came from outside the field in which he was making his prediction, he took insights from outside that field. So he was an artist without a school, one might say, Perhaps. I think that's a fair point, actually, yeah, and remember it, yeah, okay. Enough. Um, Karun, I think you're grasping the microphone. I'm grasping the microphone. So I think that um, one of the other things I wanted to ask about was the sense that I had right away when I got here uh, was that you live your life in a very total way, not in a, not in a totalitarian sense, but in a very... Uh, boundaryless way and the, just the way that the space is organized it's the, the views it really seems like there are the boundaries between concepts which are usually kept separate are not meaningful to you that you you meld from material to welding to or you know to the age of agriculture um evolution uh certain forms fossils uh, you know to all kinds of ideas that are just uh, seemingly unrelated, but for you, they represent part of your historical context. And so I feel like, it can, you know, can you appreciate the work of an artist who approaches his life and work that way without knowing some of that? Is it, is it, a, is it a valid approach to simply approach it in a sort of optical, um, you know, picture plane kind of fashion? And that was, you know, it was always my sense right from the beginning that that wasn't, wasn't possible. Um, but I wasn't sure about that. So, I mean, I don't know if anybody else, how anybody else feels about that. Joan. Um, I, I, actually, it's interesting because when I um, take people to, uh, around the museum, I'm an educator at the Museum of Modern Art oftentimes. 
And I, when I take them to see abstract paintings, I tell them that um, actually without some sense of the ideas, they are actually knowing as little as they know about a work of Dutch 17th century art. But they're more comfortable with a work of Dutch 17th century art because they think they know something about it because they recognize the object. But I explain to them that they know nothing about the meaning. That um, what art historians do is, you know, teach us what the meaning, what the work actually means is very often at odds than what it looks like. And the same thing is true with abstract art. That there's lots of meaning there. That when you approach it, what's helpful about learning about it is that you learn about the meaning. That trans, what, you know, just looking at the shape of a Rothko doesn't tell you anything that um, about about the meaning. And I think. Um, to some degree, there, there's something of that is true with Jeffrey's work, that when a visitor comes in, sees it, brings his own response, yes, all of that is very true, but otherwise, it's kind of inert. But do, I, don't, I don't deny that, it, that you can get pleasure or pain or anything from simply viewing or experiencing work. I mean, I, I knew nothing about Rothko, and then <clears throat> seeing it was an incredible experience, and I really didn't have any background. Yes, yeah, so it's both valid. But I, I don't know if pleasure is meaning or pain. I, don't, I, just, I just think we, that uh, it's, it's helpful for visitors to understand that what they're seeing is only what they're seeing. And that we know as little about it. it it's the same, it's essentially the same concept that you know as little, you think you know more about the 17th century Dutch painting because you think you know what you're seeing. But in fact, what you're seeing is, is such um, it's almost nothing. It's only it's as skin deep as seeing the abstract work. We tend to think of meaning as certainly post enlightenment as a kind of as the positive space, don't we? We don't look so much in the negative space. The absence of meaning mm -hmm. is its own meaning. I mean, it's it's like Nietzsche was saying that you know history is curious, sort of um, you know, uh, it's it's a malady, it's a disease. We can be obsessed with always moving along a path t with the expectation that, that some meaning will be yielded. And actually, I thought it was kind of interesting what you were saying about perfection, which I, I, I wonder, do you, do you, is that something separate in your mind from perfectibility? Because there's a sense that the artist, as you've described it, is driven towards the possibility, and it is optimistic in that sense, towards the possibility of, of the perfectibility of the world. and and cleaning up, in a sense, the awful mess that we, with our wars and everything else, sort of leave behind us, and... I think that the, the example that's left by those works of art that do have a moment of perfection is a statement of action, uh, a positive statement of action, and an assertion of that perfectibility. But I don't think that perfectibility should ever, ever be self-consciously sought. Because when the art enters the work, it just enters the work. It, it has a life of its own. And then from that point on, it's what drives the artist to complete the work. So I, I would say perfectibility is not on his mind. Uh, perfectibility, though, is impossible with its evolution in itself. So this is an anomaly within evolution where there is part of ourselves um, that can see this. And this is. A number of things that I see as questions for the genome as to the different things that all people share throughout the world, like the sense of the sacred. Before we begin changing the genome, we better start understanding what some of these larger understandings mean in terms of natural history and in terms of the hieroglyphs that are sitting there waiting to be interpreted as to what determines it. Because if we alter the genome, we don't know what else we're altering with it. We may cure bladder cancer, but we, can't, we may have lost our consciences. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. So it's approaching the genome from this much larger sense that's part of this essay uh, of understanding it in terms of natural history and being four billion years of, of, uh, of evolution and a culmination where we are now, where we actually have the brains to even identify it. And the, and the kind of technology to actually bring about an identification of the genome itself. And yet, it's on the verge of being altered on a basis of big pharma and on the basis of a five-year necessity that all capitalists has to do. They have to have this timeline. And so they will delve into something in order to turn a profit in five years. And I'm not even criticizing them for doing so. 
I'm criticizing with the genome right now all of the people who are cultivating ignorance of it and the meaning of it, not themselves participating in the, the entire action about it. So what does that have to do with perfectibility? It has to do, uh, perhaps you have to have that ability of the moment of perfection, the perception of it, and perhaps it's very particular among both artists and, and people who can see that, to understand that something lives beyond the idea itself within us uh, 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 on the question of perfectibility or on perfection itself. That it exists in art is an example, and, and, and it seems to me it does exist among so many people who I know who can both perceive it and, and can do it. You know, that, that it does happen, and what I'm saying is perhaps it's all over the world. Sorry. David. Uh, I, I find it quite difficult coming to terms with this idea of uh, the, the moment of perfection. Well, moment of perfection, I can kind of understand, but it's a, it seems to me, forgive me. You haven't been on the tour yet. No, we'll I'm, go on the tour. Yeah. We'll go yeah, on the tour, and I'll show you what not exactly knowing anything it, never stopped me offering an opinion. I'm no. really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's, so a moment of perfection I can understand as reaching a point of saying, okay, I'm satisfied um, with, this, um, with this work. Uh, but, uh, but let me ask, for example, you've been... You see, I, I look at, I've, I've been, I was mentioning to Jane last night that as part of a bit of thing that I was involved in Barry with, when we put together an exhibition on strings related to string theory and, and all the rest, it was great. We were allowed into the vault at the Henry Moore Foundation. My God, what an experience. And he pulled out these sheets where he was developing his ideas. And it was clear that each of these little sketches, I suspect he said, okay, I've, I've, I've taken this as far as I can, but I want to try something else. So there's a whole... For, for people like you, this is a wonderful field in which to study the development of, of ideas. So my question is, in your development of an, of an idea for a piece, was it some point where you said, I'm actually not going to reach a moment of perfection for this, Absolutely. and you destroyed a piece? Right? Absolutely. Have you discussed this? And, and if you have discussed, then we just move on. Absolutely. You'll get Absolutely. this on the tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the answer is, is yes. And the more uh, uh, adept that I've become at modeling, computer modeling, the more rejection that there is, you know, the more rejection there is because it's so much easier to throw it out. But you're throwing out time, you know. Yeah. No, if you're stuck on something, and, and you're never going to get there. You have an obligation to that moment of perfection. And that was what I wanted to do because I think I had the freedom of doing it in developing all of this work. Uh, Maria wants to say something and then I'll say something. Yeah, just Maria. very briefly. One thing that we, we haven't discussed, and uh, John uh, it was very helpful when I was talking about this yesterday, is you say, I work in a strange way, which you said a few minutes ago. Um, Didn't even think I said that. You begin with a sketch, <laughs> uh, it goes into the computer, you know, you've got this new hardware the last few years, you can make it three-dimensional. Then you have all of these many, many pieces of paper in which you're working out the angles, you're working out the mathematics of it. Is that mm -hmm. right? Could you just for a moment well, speak on that? Uh, it's, I don't... it's hard to explain. But it has to be fully modeled, and what I have found since I have this ability, that there's absolutely no excuse, because you can look at this thing as though you're looking through a glass floor, and it has to be a complete composition when you look at it. Whereas, when you're doing it in the studio, you can only anticipate that. I know that you can crawl under any one of my pieces and take a photograph and get a complete composition, doesn't really matter. But here, there's more perfection to it. It's like... Uh, oh, I can do better than that if I, if I do it this way. So I think the work has become able to be, it's, it's not that it's better, it's able to become more complex because this is one of the aspects of the evolution of the work, is moving from one, one area of complexity to a higher level of complexity, which is my way of looking at certainly human evolution. And when I think of uh, looking at Jeffrey's work, I, I don't think so much of perfection, but I think of resolution. Uh, and that's, 
What's so interesting about these series is that you almost begin with a problem and then gradually over the course of a series you resolve that problem. So there is a great sense of satisfaction as you move from, from one to the other. But I think that you know, this is an issue that obviously you're fascinated in, Geoffrey, is this idea of art as a source of knowledge. And it, it clearly is a source of knowledge, but I think it's more than that. I think it is knowledge. Mm. Um, but it's a different kind of knowledge. It's not a knowledge that can necessarily be expressed in any other way. It's not a kind of knowledge that can necessarily be reduced to words. And I think that's what makes art so important. We think through looking, we think through experience, we think through feeling, uh, rather than necessarily through uh, a rational series of words and language. And I think that's what makes, for me, this sculpture park and, and art in general such a thrilling and intellectually challenging experience. I was just going to say, in fact, it's what the Egyptians would have called haptic knowledge. I'm sorry? It's what the Egyptians might have called haptic knowledge, the kind of knowledge that we, the way we understand the world through our nervous system or through the end mm. of our fingertips, which mm. isn't mediated through uh, narratives um, through, through, through the brain or, you know. Now, I just think that James was using words like resolution, which to my mind, I sort of started thinking about composers mm -hmm. in music and how they know when a piece is complete. I mean, some don't, some teams just keep on things. Yeah, 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 yeah. But others yeah. do, is it a sort of similar? Yeah, very, very similar, but when we go on to, I'll show you the difference in this very early work, the difference between visual counterpoint and oral counterpoint. There's a difference, and I, I, I love to describe it with the work in front of me, rather than, rather than now, because I, I think it's the initial stage of comprehending what's going on within the work. And before we do it, what, what does counterpart mean? Forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a music, can of worms you've opened, David. Yeah, in, uh, in music, the way that I use it is as is, is, um, counter melody. So that there's a mathematical melody in this direction and a mathematical melody that, now Bach will sometimes reverse them, he'll sometimes turn them on a loop, you know, but they're independent voices. And so when I use the word counterpoint, I mean, indi you know, I will use it from the musical point of view of looking for the voice, and then I'll describe the limits to music. Then we'll be looking at the piece, and then you'll see how this works within the piece, both internally to the piece and externally within this environment. Okay, and it's a very different things. <laughs> um. Karun, I noticed that it's now 12.30. Well, yes, and I, I was going to just uh, say, if there was any other comments, uh, we're, the lunch is a bit late. I know that I wanted to give Jeff a chance just to make any closing comments, but before that, uh, if there was any other thoughts or things that people wanted to ask, uh, we could do that can now. I, can I just say thank you again, actually, for the opportunity to be here. It's been brilliant. I think Joan wants to say something. Um, I just had a, a quick question. I keep coming back to kind of um, material questions, I mm. realize. Um, so forgive me for being a materialist, I guess. Um, I had a question about the working methods that was inspired by um, Maria asking me and about, but um, I'm interested in the link between the impulsive beginning and the realization uh, of working with the obdurate materials mm. and whether that uh, involved earlier on, now you use the computer, but earlier on did you have make calculations or did you sort of just have this intuitive uh, kind of engineering? Mm. Did your background with building have anything uh, to do with it? Uh, mm. Did that inform your ability to construct your own work? Uh, were calculations necessary? And did you change <laughs> compositions as you went along? Sorry, that was a rather uh, oh, yeah. big question. Uh, the easiest one is the material aspect. Is, is Of course, working on construction, I learned how to handle materials. Handling materials is, is absolute. Whether you're working in a Studebaker plant, as David Smith did. For a sculptor, the way that I work in maintaining it hands-on, I just find that... Uh, uh, it's a bad judgment of the art when somebody says, boy, he can really handle materials. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I've heard that, you know. Boy, he can really handle materials. How many times have you heard it? Many, many times. Does that mean he's any good? No, it means that he can really handle materials. <laughs> so dealing with that part of the material is one. This particular series 
on series one was done with child blocks, I said. You know, I saw them, I saw the art enter it. What I wanted from those pieces, knowing full well that the slave work in this was to come on taking this two-dimensional zero, which is a piece of pickled stainless steel plate, uh, had to be with that much obsession in it before the work could be done, that it had to be done spontaneously. So over the course of the work, of course, I would sit down and try to regather that so that I could actually do it by hand. And those pieces were meant purposefully to move from the obsession of doing the individual parts to uh, um, being able to, to finish the piece uh, uh, all on its own, you know, just put it together that way. Now, I was a, an action painter when I think I was doing my best painting. And so, uh, starting from zero, watching the action unfold, you know, that was very, very important to me. And so, the spontaneity in the work at the end was very, very critical to me. I thought that I needed it that way. That begins to change when the work becomes more dangerous. So, the, then the second series, I begin with a sketch. The sketch now looks for it's a very simple sketch. Most people would think it was garbage, but it's coded to me as to where this piece might go. And when the art enters the piece, I said, okay, I'll start that. And I still wanted the spontaneity at the end of the piece, but by then it was a little more locked in because we had those joints that were going to hold it in place. Those I did not try to specify so that the piece themselves still, and they still, three out of four of them still articulate so that you can actually place them or replace the actual angles. But once the angles were correct, uh, then that moment of perfection happened and so that completed the piece. There wasn't, wasn't, wasn't any reason to change. By the third series, I was dealing with straight plate, which were guillotines. And handling them one man uh, was a very, very dangerous life because if they slipped and let go, they, they would kill me. So. I had to know more about where those pieces were going, and I ended up modeling them with, modeling them with mat board, so that I knew where they were going to go. I knew how to lift the piece at the end, and I had a pretty good idea where that thing was going to go. Uh, that went on through the fourth piece, uh, or the fourth series. The fifth series, which is the stainless steel and returning the stainless steel series, was an attempt to once more, once the spheres were added to it. I had another problem altogether. I had the spheres as an aesthetic issue that needed the spontaneity of the rest of the pieces in order to work. So there would be just a rough sketch starting from the spheres. But I knew how the spheres would actually affect the rest of the composition within that. Uh, then I started drawing more elaborately, looking for things more elaborately uh, as, as the work progressed into the uh, exchange with the Burgess Sale. So as, as the metaphor moved towards the Cambrian explosion, more drawings were done, obviously. More modeling was done. And then uh, gradually, which took a very, very long time, between 1994 and about, well, maybe not that long, 1996. The piece that's on in the front of the book was the very first piece that I was able to model completely within a computer. Uh, but it took a long time, and, and I, I was uh, telling Barry that that piece uh, was done on a 486 with a program that would take you up to a point and then crash. And the crashability of this particular program was terrible, but the drawing qualities were absolutely superb, so I stuck it out. <laughs> yeah, thanks to Windows. <laughs> More than one. <laughs> so is there anybody else who wants to make a, a last comment or question before? Did I did that answer the question? Great, yeah. yeah. I could see Barry taking notes there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I did want to give you a really, Karun. I would just say that we've we've worked this year from meaning to the meaning of meaning, but I suggest we leave till next year the meaning of meaning of meaning. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
if there is if there aren't any other other comments, uh, we did plan, Jeffrey, that you would close the forum by any, you know if you had any last things you wanted us to know, and then yeah, go to lunch. I, so I, we're about to close it. Oh, right. that's a surprise. Well, thank you all for coming. That's number one. I guess that, that's truly an order here. Um, what's become so interesting to me is, is that uh, to hear the feedback and to have the, the written feedback uh, on the work. So this is like new for me, really, to have this much feedback about the work itself rather than about the ideas. And so the idea, too much on the ideas, but mainly on feedback on the work. That I owe to James. Uh, when I knew that all of us were going to collect here and that we were going to have these papers, uh, uh, I, I think I said, ask Karun first. I said, well, you know, let's do the forum by having James ask questions. And James returned, thought it was a great idea and returned the questions. So the questions themselves became critical as to what generated the kind of uh, conversations that we've had here. And then there's James' personality, which is absolutely fantastic on knowing how to communicate with a, a group of people. Whether, and what's fascinating, it doesn't really matter whether it's 20 people or it's probably 10 million or 20 million. He has the same ability on both cases. So the appreciation that I have of everyone coming and the inputs that they gave and on, oh, Sorry, and, and sheepish James over here. <laughs> who's just not brave enough to face the world, <laughs> um, is, is really, really, uh, I, I'm re I really appreciate it. So I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. Well, thank I want you. to say thank you so much to Jeffrey and to Betty and to Karun for, um, for having us here. I mean, it is such an extraordinary experience, um, you know, to be able to discuss these issues with the artist in uh, his sculpture park as bald eagles fly overhead and deers scamper around and it's, it's a wonderful I think we've had I, I've really enjoyed the last couple of days I think it's great to hear so many voices all contributing um, because this is you know all of us this is all part of all of us now so thank you once again Jeffrey and Betty for your generosity of having us here.